Hello guys, this is Juneria. I'm an artist producer and filmmaker based in Seoul, South Korea. I mainly film Korean pop music videos and fashion. I have started filming some of my projects with the new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the camera's form factor and my experience in general working with it. It's going to be a quite long video because I think it makes more sense uh, to give uh, some good explanations about this camera and my experiences uh, instead of just saying my opinion with without giving any information about what and why. I hope this will be really helpful to people that are considering to get this camera or people that are waiting for their order to arrive or even uh, for people that already receive their cameras and they just want to get more familiar with the options and the camera itself. So, uh, on the first touch, the camera feels much lighter than I would expect for its size. It actually weighs 720 grams without the battery, which is pretty significant for a cinema-style video camera that is capable of filming 4K 60 frames per second raw footage. Anything else I know of that is capable of this is usually in a much larger form, weighing a few kilos at least. It feels really robust and well-made, uh, like a premium product. Um, the plastic doesn't seem easy to scratch or break. The buttons can be pressed with uh, the right amount of power. Um, the ports feel strong and higher quality than your average uh, DSLR camera. The grip rubber here is definitely good quality and not something that will just wear off in a few months. And then there are these tabs here at the side uh, where you can take off to expose some of the ports. Uh, which we're going to talk about a little later. It's not like they're going to rip off that easily, except uh, you really pull them out. Well, let's not try this at this moment. In general, I think the camera can take uh, quite a beating. Not that you should do so, of course. It shows there has been a lot of uh, thought and care about the quality of the product in general. Also, it might sound a little weird, but I was happy that the smell of the camera was not that cheap plastic that you can smell on some other cheaper filming gear. It actually doesn't really smell anything as it should. Uh, it's definitely a premium product. This grip is everything. Uh, it's probably the best grip I have seen for this form factor. It has this inset here for uh, the middle finger, uh, which is in fact human's stronger finger. It allows you to hold the weight of the camera quite well, uh, which is something really important, especially if you start putting heavier and heavier lenses on. I have shot my first video with this camera called Sol Zoo, completely handheld, and that was several hours in the heat, going around and shooting, walking through the large zoo. I was mainly holding the camera with my right hand and I have not felt any kind of tiredness or pain. The camera is quite wider and larger than an average DSLR, but that's not something that is necessarily a bad thing, because if it was a smaller camera uh, with smaller screen and grip uh, and more complicated menu system, perhaps overheating problems, it would definitely be less robust and feel less professional in general for a filmmaking camera. On the other hand, it's not that large to appear like you're shooting something with a huge budget. And that's really, really awesome because uh, if you turn out at a location with a large camera system with boxes and perhaps an assistant or two, uh, that immediately raises some attention and suspicion. Like, people might be like, okay, we can get money from these people that shoot something commercial in front of our shop, or do you guys have a permit for filming? All this became clear the very first day I took the camera out. In my Soul Zoo video, for example, I was between hundreds of people with their families and kids, and not even one person felt curious about me holding this camera. And that's really good, actually, because there I am filming 4K 60fps, uh, high bit raw footage that it could become stock footage or even part of a feature film but nobody even got distracted. Uh, I blended right in uh, with the other people taking photos with uh, their DSLR or phone. Actually, I doubt many people, if any at all, knew that what I was holding is actually a video camera. If you're like me and your work includes uh, things like independent artists, music videos or uh, fashion shoots at the streets, uh, this is gold. I can also imagine the same for people that see documentaries or weddings, uh, that the less obvious the camera is, the better. 
People feel very different when they become cautious of being filmed with a large camera and sometimes the natural film can be ruined by that. On the other hand, this camera does not do any sacrifice when it comes to image quality and for that kind of shoots it also feels pretty professional in my opinion, much more than uh, DSLR. The screen of the camera is really nice, it's large, uh, very responsive and uh, to my experience uh, quite fine for most shots even out in the sun. It makes a huge difference to pull focus uh, with such a large screen and the focus picking on. It's just such a great tool to have on the camera. Some people were asking for articulating screen. I'm pretty sure Blackmagic had uh, some very good reasons uh, for not doing that. One probably is the cost. Uh, the second best thing would be just uh, a little tilt, but again I think it's hard to guarantee the quality of the stuff and at this price range I think this will really do. Uh, except a few difficult shots on the Ronin S stabilizer where the camera was completely like rotated, uh, I didn't feel like I would need an articulating screen. Uh, there are always of course external monitors, you can pick one as cheap as uh, 100 bucks actually and then you can do whatever you like with that monitor. The camera has an interesting and uh, quite obvious uh, ventilation system. The way it works is that uh, the top vents uh, suck the air in, uh, the air goes through the electronics and uh, especially the sensor. Uh, it absorbs the heat and then it comes out of the bottom vent. Uh, this is really important for keeping digital noise levels down as uh, hot camera sensors usually result into more noisy images. On the other hand, there is uh, some audible noise coming from the ventilation system, uh, which I can hear clearly when I put my ear near the camera. We're going to check later if and uh, how this affects uh, the internal microphones of the camera when recording audio. Uh, such cooling systems are very common in all kinds of cinema cameras. The only one that didn't have one of this kind was the original pocket cinema camera and that didn't really work that well since the camera would heat up uh, quite quickly. Uh, there are two microphones uh, in the camera for stereo capture and they're located right and uh, left of the sides of the lens mount. Despite the fact that Blackmagic has paid some attention to their internal microphones and they claim very low noise levels, to me this is still essentially a cinema camera and I wouldn't expect uh, from me to have some amazing uh, internal microphones. Uh, it does have other options of course for uh, connecting uh, an external uh, microphone and we're going to check them out soon. The camera does have a little speaker uh, up here on the top uh, which is great for uh, when previewing videos and you want to listen what uh, was going on. At the sides of the top of the camera you can find this standard holes for attaching a strap uh, which makes a lot of sense for this camera. It's something I felt I would like a lot when I went to the zoo for example. Uh, and it's really neat for any kind of video loggers or travelers that they just want to shoot something in high quality. The camera has two screw holes, uh, one is at the top and uh, the other is at the bottom. Uh, this is really important for attaching cages as there are two places that the cage uh, can be screwed on resulting in a solid cage that doesn't move around and it doesn't wiggle. You would know what I'm talking about uh, if you ever try putting a cage on some DSLRs that are not really designed for a cage and uh, it's just hanging from like one screw and it just wiggles around. Even if you don't get a cage, these two holes alone uh, give you many options to mount things in uh, different ways. The battery port uh, and the battery ejection system are a uh, great improvement from uh, the previous cinema camera as the battery jumps out every time uh, and it's uh, easy to take out. Most importantly, the battery port can be completely detached uh, very easily and uh, that allows you to use uh, dummy batteries like this uh, that you can then connect to another larger external battery. Here for example I just use a Sony uh, battery plate and a Sony battery and I can power up this uh, for uh, quite a few hours. In my test so far uh, the internal battery lasts just uh, below one hour. 
I have quite a few of uh, these batteries uh, with different rankings and some of them uh, I got them used so it's hard to tell exactly. My general feeling is that the camera consumes anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 uh, watt hours depending on what you're doing, the screen brightness and if you have connected an external SSD. Um, this uh, specific battery for example is about uh, 15 watt hours uh, so it's almost an hour. This uh, larger Sony battery though, uh, that I used through the dummy adapter is more than 100 watt hours, so that gets me easily 5 hours of shooting or more. Actually, I have yet to completely empty this battery with the Pocket 4K in any of my shots. I'm pretty sure uh, via a dummy adapter uh, you can actually uh, connect to any kind of plate here uh, for any kind of battery you might have. And also Blackmagic on their website, they're actually selling some kind of connections. So you don't have to use the dummy adapter here, but you can directly uh, connect any battery plate or any other kind of batteries directly to the DC input. Uh, so that's a great solution as well. This is the sensor of the camera uh, and the micro four thirds uh, mount. Uh, we're going to talk in detail about that in a later episode, uh, like what is the crop factor and characteristics and what options you have regarding lenses and how you can attach different adapters. Uh, I just wanted to show you the Micro Four Thirds mount uh, with the electronic pins, of course, so the camera communicates with electronic Micro Four Thirds lenses and therefore can control focus, zoom and aperture. I also wanted to show you the size of the sensor. Uh, many people believe this is a 4x3 aspect ratio sensor, but it's not. It's a 17x9 aspect ratio, which is exactly what the 4K DCI format suits it. Uh, so the camera always films at what people call open gate, which means using the whole sensor for filming. There is no more sensor area above that in this camera. Checking out the manufacturer marks in the camera, you can see that this was actually manufactured in Singapore, which is quite interesting, uh, as Singapore is one of the most expensive countries in the world, and kind of makes you wonder how Blackmagic can offer these cameras at these prices. In other case, I never really thought that the place of manufacturing affects the quality of the product. It's more like the quality of materials, the process and quality control that a company can apply to any place pretty much. Still, Singapore does sound very interesting uh, when other competitors make their cameras in China and Thailand uh, so they can uh, save up and make uh, more income uh, where uh, the wages there are much lower anyways. Uh, somehow those cameras do end much more expensive though. So I think what Blackmagic's founder Grant Petty says all the time about Blackmagic being a company that are not that interested in making huge incomes and rather the primary mission is offering uh, quality cinema products to filmmakers uh, that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford this camera system is kind of true. So for me, one of the most appealing points of this camera is the ease of use. My story is that my first cinema camera was the Blackmagic cinema camera. That camera had a large uh, touch screen where you could nicely navigate through all the options. To be honest, I probably got a bit spoiled by that. At some point, the Ursa Mini 4.6K came out and I realized that for any serious job with a budget, I was just running the Ursa Mini anyway, so my Blackmagic cinema camera was kind of useless as it was still a bit too heavy for any low budget work. Uh, so I sold my Blackmagic cinema camera and got a pocket cinema camera. And that was the first step down I got with the operation system of the camera. Uh, the first Pocket Cinema camera didn't have any touchscreen, just a few buttons that help you navigate through the menu system. This was of course a downgrade from Blackmagic Cinema Camera's beautiful touchscreen. Uh, finally I got spoiled by the Ursa Mini and I started using a lot of slow motion shots in my works. Uh, so I sold the Pocket Cinema Camera and I got the Micro Cinema Camera that is capable of 60 frames per second. And that has been my personal camera for a while. Uh, actually I'm shooting this very thing right now with the Micro Cinema Camera. The problem with that camera was that as it was intended as an action camera, there was the synopsis of the screen and a really awkward menu system. The reason for that is that the camera was supposed to just be set once and just be let, you know, as an action camera. If you wanted a 60 frame per second scale black magic camera, you either had the micro cinema camera or the much heavier Ursa Mini. The moment Pocket 4K was announced and I saw all these nice buttons and uh, touch screen, I was really happy that I could finally have a camera with proper navigation. It starts with this incredible power switch. 
Instead of a button that you have to press for a few seconds, there is an old style switch that can be really turned off or on accidentally. It really feels like you are turning on something. It has some kind of weird satisfaction that it's uh, you turning this machine on mechanically, like the way you unlock a door for example. The boot up takes about 4 seconds and powering down about half to 1 second depending whether you have an external SSD connected on. There are two separate recording buttons uh, that will start and stop the recording of the video. Uh, the first one is located at the tip of the index finger uh, and the second one is actually in front of the camera uh, with the intention of providing a recording option for people shooting uh, something like a video log. This is honestly a bit contradictory as this is a cinema camera after all, right? Why would anybody choose this camera for uh, their video log? Well, the honest answer to that is why not? Uh, the camera is perfectly capable of that. Uh, I have actually tried this and it works quite well. In fact, when you're holding the camera in that mode, uh, your index finger is located right above the focus button, something that I think is intentional and a very smart design, as you can simply raise the camera, uh, click that focus button and then hit record. You also have this tally light in the front uh, that turns red when you're recording. Pretty necessary for video log stuff, of course, but also as a good indicator uh, that the camera is recording when you're working with other people on uh, bigger projects. This tally light can be actually turned on and off and it also has three different brightness settings. Quite a lot of choices for a simple tally light, but again, why not? Next to the main recording button, uh, there is a little button with a camera on. This button takes a still image. As you can see, it's much more than the record button and that pretty much shows us that this is a video camera, not a stills camera, but okay, it also takes stills. But this is not the kind of still that you would take uh, from a dedicated stills camera. There's no synchronization with flash or other settings you would find in a standard uh, stills camera. This button pretty much saves one single frame, which is whatever you share the screen at that time. It's the exact same thing as filming a video in RAW and getting one frame out of the video. When holding the camera at your index finger, you will find this wheel, which feels uh, really great. This controls the aperture of the lenses, providing you have electronic lenses, of course. I found this so smooth and intuitive, almost as good as shooting with cine lenses, actually. One of the reasons I'm using manual declick lenses is that I really like adjusting my aperture fast and easy while shooting, and this wheel made it almost as good uh, for electronic lenses. Really neat. There are three little buttons just above the recording button. One for the ISO, one for the shutter and one for white balance. All these work in combination with the wheel in the index finger. So if you want to change your ISO, for example, uh, you just hit the ISO button and then just scroll the wheel uh, till you get the value you want. Then you can either hit the ISO button again or actually push the wheel in. Same goes for the shutter speed and of course for uh, white balance. You can still do all that using the touch screen, uh, but we will get uh, to that a little later. At the back of the camera you can find six buttons. Uh, the top two are exclusive to electronic lenses and as I'm only using manual lenses I will not be able to show you how they work but at least I can explain. The top button is the auto iris button. What this does when you press it is that it measures the exposure of the current image and automatically adjusts the aperture of the lenses to compensate. I'm not sure how of a useful function this is. I'm pretty sure some people might use it, uh, that's why it's there. I never really used it in my work and as we will see later, the camera does offer much better ways to set exposure. The button below is the autofocus button. Uh, this is not continuous autofocus. The camera at least at this point doesn't offer such thing. I'm not sure if Blackmagic is uh, after that audience, but no matter what people say uh, that this camera is a cinema camera and why would uh, it have autofocus, your cinematographers do not use autofocus and all this stuff, the fact is it wouldn't hurt anybody if Blackmagic actually was getting some kind of semi-decent autofocus in there. In another case, the current autofocus button will focus in uh, whatever is in the center of the image, or uh, you can actually simply click anywhere in the screen uh, and the autofocus will uh, focus at whatever you're touching. Uh, and that can be done even where you're actually filming. So essentially you can kind of pull focus this way, although like any kind of autofocus, you never know if it's really, really gonna work. Uh, nevertheless, a very useful function to set your focus uh, before a shot. Then we have these four bundles with the first being the high frame.
frame rate button. This is my favorite as it switches between whatever frame rate you have set as off-speed recording and the frame rate of your project. This allows you to switch, uh, for example, between uh, 24 and 60 frames per second just with one button. In combination with the fact that the camera offers uh, a shutter angle option, it means you don't need any other changes for shooting slow motion shots except adjusting the exposure, of course. It's a really handy button that I have been using on the Ursa Mini Pro for a long time and I'm really happy it's there as in my kind of work I switch constantly between normal frame rate and slow motion. Uh, more about slow motion coming later in this video. Below the high frame rate button there is the zoom button. This does not actually zoom your lenses, it just zooms in the screen so you can see some detail and perhaps focus your lenses better. You can actually move anywhere around the screen and see it in detail. The next button brings up the menu of the camera and uh, there is also a playback button which is used for previewing whatever you have filmed. We're going to talk about this when exploring the menu system a bit later. Finally, uh, we have these uh, three function buttons up here. These are fully programmable buttons and can be really helpful actually as you can turn on and off things like false color or focus peaking or uh, the coloring of the image so you can see the log image. At the right side of the camera there is a port that exposes the CFAST and SD card slots. It feels very robust and the spring is really high quality and effective. On the left side of the camera we can find the rest of the camera sport. You can find the standard 3.5mm microphone or line input and headphones output. There is a full size HDMI port that can output 10-bit 1080p up to 60 frames per second. Do note here that this camera already records internally all sorts of high bitrate codecs like ProRes and of course RAW, so it wouldn't really be necessary to use any kind of external recorder through the HDMI port. Uh, when you want to record in higher quality, like it's necessary with other mirrorless and DSLR cameras. Right below we see a 12 volt 2 pin power connector. The camera comes with this power adapter and the pin locks in really nicely. It's this kind of professional pin that locks in really tightly and you need to pull it up like this in order to unlock. The pin has a spring actually and you pull it up like this. This would definitely not cause you any problems. Both the micro HDMI connectors and the power connector were a little too weak in the first pocket cinema camera and there were incidents that they would break off so I think Blackmagic here really addressed uh, those problems uh, by providing very strong connectors. Below the power input there is a mini XLR port where you can connect microphones on and it even provides phantom power, something that many professional microphones need. You will need a cable or a connector that adapts the normal sized XLR to the smaller size mini XLR. In either case it's really neat to have this input on as for people that actually need to record sound in their projects this alone might be enough uh, and uh, they might not need any external recorder and uh, the extra logistics that come with it like extra batteries, SD cards, offloading, matching with the video, with the recorded audio and so on. Finally, there is this USB-C port. Now, this is where things get a little interesting. Firstly, you can use this port, uh, of course, for updating the firmware of the camera when you connect it on a computer. Secondly, you can actually charge the internal batteries through a USB-C power bank or wall charger when the camera is off, but you cannot really power the whole camera through there while it's operating. You can do that of course through the power input or using a dummy battery adapter. The most interesting use of this USB-C port though is the ability to record to external drives. For example, I've been using this Samsung T5 500GB SSD which is really small and light and only costed me about $120. I can go on record raw footage for a very long time or hours and hours of ProRes and do note here that this is a video camera and therefore there are no limitations on the length of recording times like some stills cameras stop recording every 20 or 30 minutes for example. I will be talking in detail about the formats of the camera, the media solutions and how to handle post-production in future episodes. The USB-C port is actually designed to lock in place and it's very unlikely the disc is going to fall even uh, hanging from the camera. Of course this is definitely not the most elegant way to use it and there are many solutions to that. For example a quick solution is to use some velcro to attach the disc on the top or the bottom of the camera like I've been doing in all my shots. It's actually so sturdy I never had any problems with this setup. 
But of course, there are a lot of kind of accessories that could allow you to mount this disc in a different way anyways. Or of course, if you can get a cage for this camera, you will have uh, many more mounting points. In fact, most cages presented so far seem to actually come with a slot for inserting a T5 drive like this, so it can be really neat. I'm pretty sure there are going to be nice solutions for mounting larger SSD drives like this one. You can easily get a SATA to USB-C adapter and use this kind of discs. My own opinion, and we're going to be talking more about that when uh, we're going to talk about the media, is that the T5 is much smaller and more elegant and is not that terribly more expensive uh, than the conventional SSD discs. In other case, you can already record some flavors of uh, Cinema DNG RAW on uh, this kind of SD cards. And now that Blackmagic RAW was introduced, uh, you might actually be able to record hours of RAW in uh, simple SD cards, so maybe you don't need an SSD drive. So thank you guys for watching this video. I tried my best to explain how this camera feels and works in general. Uh, we'll be doing more videos that I will be talking more specifically about the camera menu and other matters like the camera formats and media, the ISO and exposure controls, uh, as well as uh, things like color grading and so on. So have a nice day and best luck on your future shots.